All right. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. We're, here we go. And we're going to be talking about Ebola, <clears throat> one of my favorite topics. Um, Ebola is an extremely interesting virus. Um, just the way it appeared, how just the genetic makeup of it, and um, how it how it uh, how it impacts people. <clears throat> so, and of course, being here in Dallas, we have a uh, we have kind of a uh, personal uh, story about it, uh, having been one of the places that Ebola showed up. All right, so we talk about Ebola. What is Ebola? <clears throat> First, we classify Ebola as a filovirus. Um, other filoviruses we have is Hantavirus, we have Marburg virus. Um, <clears throat> so we, these are in the category of filovirus. It contains negative sense RNA. We'll talk more about that here in a second. Has a helical capsid and it is rod shaped or I'm sorry, rope shaped. Now the rope kind of <clears throat> kind of has a loop on the end. It almost looks like a shepherd's crook, something a shepherd would, would have out there. So um, it would be elongated and rope shaped, but kind of have a little loop on the end of it. What is a virus? <clears throat> First of all, a virus is an agent that is too small to be seen with a regular microscope. Um, the Ebola and any virus out there really can only be detected using an electron microscope, which is an extremely high powered microscope that, uh, that is used when, when, uh, when looking at viruses. <clears throat> and when we talk about Ebola, if you watch any shows about Ebola, you'll see them in a dark room and there's almost like a green light coming from a microscope. That is an electron microscope. A virus can only replicate inside a living host. <clears throat> so there must be a living host in order for this virus to continue its lifespan. Once the virus dies, or well, I'm sorry, once the host dies, the virus ha does not have any way to continue um, replicating and living out its life cycle. So it then dies. Okay, so it has to be within a living host. <clears throat> All viruses have a nucleic acid and a capsid. Um, some also have a protein coat. Nucleic acid is the most infectious part of the virus. <clears throat> you see there in the diagram, um, we have the, the black, uh, almost looks like a tertiary shape. That is the nucleic acid. We have the caposmere, which is the outside of it. And then the capsid it basically encompasses the whole thing. Negative sense RNA means that the virus has to go through an extra step during, infect, during that infectious process. <clears throat> that positive sense RNA does not have to go to. Basically, it has to go from a negative sense RNA, has to go through an extra sense that changes itself to positive sense RNA, so then, then it can continue attacking the body. All right, so that's the extra step it has to go through. Basically, it has to convert itself. Ebola first appeared in a small Danish um, or Flemish uh, uh, hospital in a town called Yambuku, Zaire. Zaire is, tr is currently known as the Democ Democ Democratic Republic of Congo. <clears throat> and uh, back in the 70s, it was known as Zaire. And what started happening was um, you started having patients coming into this Flemish hospital that was operated by uh, nuns uh, that, that were nurses. <clears throat> and, and they would appear with a high fever and just very tired, lethargic. And, and so, and the other thing is that, that they would, you would see blood in their eyes <clears throat> or they would be bleeding out of their, their rectum or their nose or sometimes their ears. And what really alarmed the, the nuns was that they, this hospital was used a lot to, uh, to birth children. And the mothers after giving birth would hemorrhage. And this is something they hadn't seen before. It, yeah, you may get one every, every now and then, but not continuously. So, after, so while the woman was giving birth, basically she would bleed out. 
And this was concerning <clears throat> to the nurses and the nuns, and they just, they didn't understand what was going on here. Um, gentleman, a, a gentleman came from another, uh, basically showed up from the woods <clears throat> and he was, had a extremely high fever. He looked like he had been sick for days and he goes to, uh, to the mission hospital and he, he similarly dies there. Once again, the nurses hadn't seen anything like this before. And, and so they get word out to one of the big cities that is about a two days journey from Yambuku Zaire and saying about this, you know, the strange illness people are, are coming down with. One of the head nurses, um, she, it was, you can understand, they were very low on equipment. They are funded by the Catholic Church. They just don't have a lot of supplies, especially in the middle of an African jungle. So a lot of these births that they would do, um, the nurses and nuns would not wear gloves. <clears throat> so they would just use their bare hands to, to birth children. Well, one nurse, the head nurse, she gets sick following one of her patients that hemorrhages out upon delivery. She gets sick and she subs subsequently dies. This really impacts the, the, the nurses. Um, one of their coworkers, one of the people that they live with, they commune with, that they live life with, died. And died almost in the same fashion that the other people died. Extremely high fever, malaise, just not feeling herself, um, <clears throat> massive diarrhea, bleeding from the eyes and the nose and the rectum. <clears throat> Um, prior to 76, no one ever heard of Ebola. It, just, it stayed within the jungles. <clears throat> and the first, the first outbreak at the Catholic uh, hospital was really the first time this, this new virus came about, which will ultimately become a new virus. <clears throat> and and uh, samples of the nurse's blood was sent back to Belgium, where a very young, uh, brand new doctor, Peter Piot, got the samples and started uh, looking at the samples and trying to figure out what is going on here? What, what is causing this? Unable to determine what it was, uh, Piot sent samples to London and Atlanta to try and figure out what this new virus was. <clears throat> Dr. Carl Johnson, who is seen right here in the white shirt in the back, um, really is the one that, that discovered that this is a brand new virus. Dr. Peter Piot, this is him right here. Um, he's also one of the ones that was in the, it's in the, the, um, the AIDS documentary that you all watched as well. All right, <clears throat> it's the same, same guy. He seems to be on the front lines of new virus outbreaks. <clears throat> so they, they now ha see that this is a brand new virus. N it's never, never been seen before. <clears throat> and now, now the work begins. Now they got to try and investigate it and figure out, okay, what is causing it? Who's causing it? And how do we get rid of it? <clears throat> um, in Yambuku, um, when, the, when the teams arrived, they, they encountered almost a ghost town. Outside the mission, there were signs that says, anyone who passes this fence will die. The nuns tried to shut it all down and to try and, try and contain this, this virus. They, they don't want it getting out. If they could contain it, they're great. But if their fear was if it got out, it can do a lot more damage. Now, you have Yambuku Zaire. Around Yambuku, you have other small little villages, you know, within a several hours walk. And they didn't want those, they didn't want this virus to spread to those smaller villages. So once again, they try to shut it down. So when Dr. Carl Johnson and Peter Piot, when that's when this picture was taken actually in Yambuku Zaire, <clears throat> and, uh, and when Peter Piot here in the colorful shirt and Carl Johnson, when they got there, they were horrified to what they saw. 
So one of the one of the things in regard to a new virus is you got to give it a name. Traditionally, viruses are named by bodies of water that um, that they're found nearby. So, for example, West Nile virus. It was found by the Nile River. <clears throat> Marburg virus. Marburg is found by the uh, is, is named after the uh, the Marburg River in Germany. I went to really the first cases of Marburg virus were seen. So what do you call this new virus? Well, <clears throat> doctors started throwing, throwing around the word Yambuku fever. The problem was this. They didn't want to stigmatize a whole village by naming a, a new virus that is deadly after it. So, so they, knew, they wanted to come up with another name. Dr. Carl's Johnson, he actually came up with the name Ebola, named after the Ebola River, which is nearby to um, Yambugu Zaire. So that's how we get the name Ebola. It's named after the Ebola River. <clears throat> As researchers investigated the new outbreak, they were puzzled to see some villages were completely wiped out and others left untouched. As they started branching out from Yambuku, what they started finding were villages just gone. Villages that once had, you know, 100 people living in them, uh, men, women, children, they were gone. It was wiped out. They would find some dead bodies and others gone. Um, did the others leave and go to another village? They die in the jungle trying to get to another village? They didn't know. What they did know was that this wiped out villages nearby. <clears throat> and so that, that gave a lot of pause to, to the researchers and this new virus. <clears throat> One of the major questions that surrounded Ebola was, how did people get it? Well, once again, this mission did not have a lot of, of money and they did not have a lot of supplies. They had to basically do with what they had. <clears throat> so in that, when people in the local villages would come by to get vaccinations, they would use the same needles. That's all they had. They, they didn't have the, the, the supply to throw away a needle every time they used it. So when they would give an injection, a vaccine, they would use the same needle for, they would, they would take this dirty needle out of the patient's arm, put it in a vial, pull up the medicine, put it in another patient's arm. <clears throat> the other thing that was going on was that the nurses, like I said, they didn't have enough supplies to gown up or glove up when delivering children. And, and when you're delivering babies, there is a certain amount of fluid contact you're, you're, you're coming in contact with. Blood, after birth. Um, so there, there's all this stuff which all carries Ebola. And so the nurses were having to deal with this with their bare hands. But once again, they didn't know. It's not like they were aware of this. Uh, so. So they, they did the best with what they had. Um, <clears throat> and so when they started tracing back things, come to find out people were getting this because unknowingly from the Yambuku clinic, it was not done, you know, there was no mal maliciousness behind it. There's no malfeasance. It was just, they're there to help the community and they're, they're helping the, the community to the best of their understanding and using whatever supplies they have. They're trying to be smart with their supplies. They didn't know they were, they were injecting villagers with a lethal virus. <clears throat> After the first 1976 outbreak of Ebola, um, we found that Ebola had a 88% kill rate. <clears throat> That's extremely high. As we'll talk about, there are different strains of Ebola. This is the first. This is known as um, Ebola Zaire. And this has a, between an 85 and a 90% kill rate. <clears throat> so it is, it's an extremely lethal pathogen. And when all is said and done, Ebola would disappear back into the jungles of Africa and not to be heard of, uh, not to be heard from for a while down the road. <clears throat> So with that being said, there are five strains of, 
of uh, Ebola. There's the Ebola Zaire, which we, we, it says 60 to 90, we actually place it more in the 80s to 90s. Ebola Sudan, which uh, Ebola would make its way across the border into Sudan. And that strain of Ebola, as, so remember, viruses mutate over time. <clears throat> when they jump from host to host to host to host to host, they mutate. And, uh, and so over time, the Zairean strain, when it got into a new host, it mutated and became the Ebola Sudan strain. <clears throat> this has four, between a 40 and 60% kill rate. The Ivory Coast strain, which is on the west coast of Africa, the, this has a, between a 40 and 80% kill rate. Once again, it jumped from a different host and it mutated and it mutated into the Ivory Coast strain. Then you have the Ebola Reston strain, which we'll talk about here in, in, in a second. This one they found predominantly in, in monkeys, <clears throat> but it was non-lethal to humans. And then the newest strain of Ebola is Ebola Bundabayo strain, which is um, has between, it's still relatively new, so we're still trying to figure out all the exact numbers on it, but it looks like right now it have between 70 or 25 and a 70% kill rate. Um, so we, we're definitely dealing with a with a lethal strain. <clears throat> Bull comes to America. In 1989, in a uh, primate quarantine facility um, outside of Washington, D.C., in a town called Reston, Virginia, um, monkeys mysteriously started dying. And you got to understand the, uh, the, the quarantine, the facility. Let me get to another screen. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I will draw this for you. So basically, we had almost, we had corridors. So you would have a hallway, you would have one holding facility here. You have another hallway, you would have another holding facility here. Okay, same here. Okay. And then you had a chamber on the end. So, <clears throat> so th this is what you would have. This is, you would have corridor A, B, C, D, and E. All of these were sealed to themselves. So there was a big door here. There was a big door here, big door here, here, and here. All right. So there was no overlap from A to B. Okay. <clears throat> the animals in A stayed in A. They did not go over to area B. The workers in area A stayed in area A. They did not go over to area B or D or E, okay? <clears throat> so this is a full quarantine facility. And the purpose was of this was that companies, whether it be medical research or um, uh, cosmetic research, anything like this, they would buy monkeys. Per US uh, regulations, these monkeys had to be quarantined for a certain amount of time to make sure they were not sick with any primate um, disease that could possibly mutate and become uh, lethal to the human population. <clears throat> well, monkeys started getting very sick in quarantine A. And the handlers in that area would notice that some of the ones that had died died in very horrific ways. They almost, almost like they bled to death, <clears throat> but not from any, any trauma. They were just in their cages and they would bleed out. So what, what, Ebo, what, uh, what the Hazeltine Research uh, Facility did was reach out to USAMRID. USAMRID stands for the United States Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases. It is part of the United States Army. It is one of the two places here in the United States that has what's called a, a bio level four quarantine facility, which uh, viruses like Ebola, <clears throat> Marburg, Hantavirus, these are known as bio level four. Um, there is no known cure and highly infectious. Okay, that, that's what bio level four means. <clears throat> so they, uh, they notified USAMRID. USAMRID uh, sent uh, veterinarians and doctors in 
to go in and investigate and find out what's going on at, at the Hazleton Research Facility. And what they found was that they, when they, when they took specimens, they would actually take monkeys that had died back to USAMRID. The, this bottom picture, this is actually the new USAMRID. <clears throat> um, the old USAMRID, uh, you can see, actually see it in um, the movie Outbreak, that uh, kind of sandstone colored building that is USAMRID. This up here is, was the Hazleton uh, Research Facility. So when they, when they got these samples back to USAMRID, they started looking at it and what they found was Ebola. They, they, they put it underneath, underneath the electron microscope and they ran their polymers chain reactions um, test on it. And what they found was Ebola. Ebola is in America. And this was scary. Never before had Ebola come over to America. <clears throat> and what, what's, what's scarier is that this Hazleton Research Facility was located right next door to an elementary school. Think about that. It was located right next door to an elementary school that had playgrounds and stuff out there. Had this virus escaped, we could have affected all those children and they would have gone home to their families and affected all their families, okay? So this was the fear. <clears throat> Ultimately come to find out through all the testing was that this strain of Ebola, which would become known as Ebola restin, was not lethal to humans. Even though you had some workers from the Hazleton Research Facility get sick around the same time, it was not linked to the Ebola restin outbreak. So what USAMRID did was they sent doctors and veterinarians in and they had to euthanize all the monkeys, whether they were sick or not. And the question arises, well, why they don't they just test the monkeys and the ones that don't have it, just let them live? The problem is this, it's too dangerous to the veterinarians and the doctors because there is, an, an, there's, there's a process of what you have to go to in order to get the monkey. You gotta basically hold the monkey and inject the monkey and euthanize it, or, or I'm sorry, to draw blood, all right? I mean, that, 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 that's a lot harder than what it just sounds like, okay? You gotta make sure you're hitting the artery, arm inside the vein, you're pulling the blood out, and there's, just a, there's a lot of unknown variables in there. It's easier just to restrain the monkey at a distance, inject them with a, a, a lethal dose of whatever they use to kill uh, primates with and have them die. And then dispose of their bodies, burn them afterwards, okay? That was the plan and that's what they did. Um, they did it overnight and the, they wanted to try and do it under, at, at, under the cover of darkness because what they did not want was the press to be alerted that Ebola had made it to America. This would send rest of Virginia and the United States into a panic had this information come out. <clears throat> the author Richard Preston wrote a book about um, this outbreak known as the hot zone. Um, and, and it also made a movie about it as well <clears throat> that actually showed on National Geographic last year, and you can buy it on Amazon. Um, it's called the Hot Zone as well. Initial, like I said, initial testing revealed something much worse. Ebola, specifically the Zairean strain, um, initially that, that, that's what this looked like. Um, it, it matched everything to Zairean strain. Um, the PCR testing matched Zaire, except in one small area. And then that's when they realized this is a different strain of Ebola. This, this strain of Ebola, Ebola restin, is only infectious to primates, but not humans. Okay, the, the book, The Hot Zone, is really good. <clears throat> Richard Preston um, is very good at writing um, science, and he made, and it's a very gripping book. He has several as well. Uh, the Hot Zone, The Demon in the Freezer, um, I'm reading another one of his right now. I think it's called uh, Beyond the Hot Zone. 
So it's really good. It's a really good book. If you have a chance to read it, I, I highly recommend it. So after the Ebola rest and, uh, outbreak, basically Ebola went dormant. We really didn't hear about it until cases started rising up in Guinea in uh, 2013 when a two-year-old became really, really ill and then died. Um, this is how the worst outbreak of Ebola to date started. The patient zero was known as Emil Omanu. And he, he, I say he was two years old and he became really sick and in a matter of several days, he had died. It's unknown as to how Emil Amanu actually contracted Ebola. Um, many believe that, um, that there was a hollowed out tree that was the home to many uh, fruit bats in the area and that they were playing in the tree and maybe they picked up a bat or playing with it um, and got infected that way. Um, but as after Emil Amanu died, members of his family also began to die. And as they died, it, they would go out, before they died, they would go out to other members of the community and spread it, okay? So if we look at Emil Amanu here on the, on the chart here, he is known as patient zero. He died on December 6, 2013. From his same household, his sister would die three weeks later. His mother would die uh, roughly you know, a week and a half after Emil Amanu. His grandmother would die on January 1st, 2014. The nurse who took care of the grandmother would die on February 2nd. And then the village midwife um, who worked with the nurse died on February 2nd. So from these people right here, they attended, for the most part, most of them, like the sister, the mother, the granddaughter, a, a grandmother attended Mila Manu's funeral. They got it. The nurse who attended the grandmother got it. The village midwife who, who worked with, with the nurse got it and died. All right, so six family members from, uh, from Mila Manu and the midwife would die. Three deaths in, uh, in Gandu village. Um, six deaths in, uh, uh, in the Pambu village, and then uh, eight deaths in Adawa village. Um, eight deaths, including two attending, uh, attended the grandmother's funeral. So the grandmother had a funeral. Two people who attended that also died, okay? The, the outbreak began escalating in February and March, and, it's, and then it would spread out. We're actually gonna watch a documentary on this, and uh, you'll understand how this, how this happens. Going in, out of 2013, in December 2013, when the Milamanu died, going into 2014, um, <clears throat> Ebola is going to spread at a rapid pace. It spread over the uh, border of Guinea into Liberia. So here's the border of Guinea and Liberia. It was spread into Liberia. From Liberia, it would then spread into Sierra Leone. And, uh, and the problem is this, you have in Liberia, Monrovia, you have Freetown, which are major cities in, in, both, these, in both these countries. What do you have when you have major cities? You have airports. When you have airports, you have people getting on airplanes, traveling. It is likely, uh, that it likely traveled from Liberia into Sierra Leone by a traditional healer who treated Ebola patients across the border in Guinea. So start down in Guinea, went down to Liberia, treated Ebola patients down here, then went up to Sierra, Sierra Leone. <clears throat> Investigators found that 14 of the mourners who'd attend, who attended this healer's funeral contracted the virus. So 14 people who went to this healer's funeral who died also got Ebola. Now nearly uh, a year later after Emil Manu died, Three countries have seen more than 10,000 cases of Ebola and more than, oh, almost 5,000 people have died of the disease. Okay, and you, we have the, the uh, grid down here. 
if you see the dark, dark red, that's between 301 and 840 new cases. So we have it here in Monrovia. We have it here in uh, Port, uh, Port Loco, it looks like. Um, and then the lighter shade of red, 151 to 300 cases, and we have in, in Bombo. And it just goes you know, from there. This is a lot of people in infected. Ebola would make its way to America in two ways, one in a contained way, one in a non-contained way. The contained way is this. Dr. Kent Brantley, who is actually from Fort Worth, he actually practices at um, Harris Methodist in downtown Fort Worth. Um, he volunteers for a, uh, for a mission, a medical mission uh, called Samaritan's Purse, which is run by Franklin Graham, uh, uh, the son of Billy Graham. And he's a doctor and he volunteers to go over and work these Ebola villages as a physician. As he's working these, these missions, he one morning he gets up, he's not feeling that great. He takes his temperature, he has a fever. He contacts his contact there um, <clears throat> in, a, in where he's working in Liberia and says, listen, I have a fever. Here's a vial of my blood, go have it tested. They have it tested. And one of his close coworkers arrives to tell him, he goes, Kent, you have Ebola. He quarantines himself to, that, to his house there in, uh, in Liberia. Well, at the same time, a nurse that worked next, worked with Dr. Kent Brantley, Nancy Wrightbull, she also contracts Ebola. Samaritan's Purse reaches out to the US government and says, listen, we have two Americans, one a physician, one a volunteer who are infected with Ebola. If we leave them in Liberia, they're going to die. And so the Obama administration starts looking at things and is like, okay, how do we go about getting these Americans home? What's the safest way? Because we got to think about what's safe for the crew what's safe for the doctors and, and Nancy Reibel, and what's safe for our country. So what it is, they, what they do is they rent out a, uh, a, a, a Gulfstream aircraft that is specially outfitted with isolation chambers. So the, and here's the picture of the isolation chamber here. <clears throat> it's just two parts right in the inner chamber is where the patient would be. <clears throat> in the outer chamber, this is where um, healthcare workers would be. And then it's sealed again to protect anyone here in the aircraft. So everything can be done on the outside and within this inner chamber. They fly, first they fly Dr. Kim Brantley back. Um, he's the uh, more critical of the patients at the time. So they fly him back first. Then they fly um, Nancy Wrightbull in. And I'll show, I'll show a video of this as well. And, and they both go to Emory Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, Atlanta, Georgia is the home of the CDC, the Center for Disease Control. So with them being at Emory Hospital in downtown Atlanta, they can actually have access to all the CDC doctors, plus the fabulous doctors and uh, virologists and infectious disease docs at Emory Hospital as well. All right, so they both arrive. Here's Dr. Kent Brantley arriving here. He actually walked out of the ambulance and would walk inside the hospital through a, through a, a service door. And then they would take him to the uh, isolation floor where the doctors would then get him settled. They would you know, start running tests and start treatment on him, which is basically a lot of fluid replenishment. And then here's Nancy Reitbull <clears throat> um, being flown in and being transported into um, Emory Hospital as well. They will both survive. <clears throat> um, they got a lot of fluids. They had some experimental drugs, and eventually they would recover from Ebola. Uh, Dr. I actually read an article just the other day that Dr. Kim Brantley and his wife Amber actually are um, either are or in the process of moving to Africa right now. Um, he took a position with another um, uh, missions group to go and work at a hospital there. And, uh, and he's a missionary and that's what they feel like their calling is to go to Africa and work. 
So he will be moving if he has not already um, to uh, Africa to work as a as a physician down there. And Nancy Ripoll was actually an English teacher before quitting her job and volunteering with Samaritan's Purse and going to Africa to help. Ebola arrives in Dallas. I'm gonna stop there because this is a long story and I wanna have plenty of time for it because it's very interesting on, on how this happens, okay? So I'm gonna stop there and uh, we will continue this uh, next time. And, I'm, and uh, if anyone has any questions, just uh, uh, fill out the Google form and we will talk about this on Friday.